Hey there, folks. I'm Eric Osberg, the Rural Rebound Initiative Coordinator for Otter Tail County, and we're back with another Better Together conversation. We haven't had one of these conversations in a while, but there's been a, a development, if you will, in, in the world of, of rural living. And uh, joining me now is Ben Winchester. Ben is a rural sociologist with the University of Minnesota Extension. How are you doing today, Ben? Doing great, Eric. Thanks. I, 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 whenever I talk about you, Ben, I always credit you for my job because you're the your research it, it has led to my job. So right. I, if, if I haven't said thank you lately, <laughs> thank you for for getting me a job. Yeah, there's a lot of groups that help develop what you all have going on there in Otter Tail County. You've got a really strong network of social capital and financial capital to back that up. So thank you guys, really. So for somebody who's unfamiliar with Ben Winchester, somebody who's unfamiliar with you, we'll, we'll get to the particular study in a second, but um, <laughs> in a nutshell, can you describe what you do for uh, the University of Minnesota Extension? Sure, uh, I've got a couple different roles, but the primary one that I that I work on and extend out to our small towns is uh, is research, applied research, under an umbrella of what I call rewriting the rural narrative. And my premise behind really all my research is that, you know, our rural communities are not dying. We're not dead. Like, you know, the proclamations that, you know, hey, we're going to we have to close our grocery store. Our small towns just dying like it's another nail in the coffin. Like we've had all these things go on. We have had all these things go on in our small towns. But really, the trends that I found, we've had a migration of people in their 30s, 40s and 50s moving in. The number of nonprofit groups goes up by 10 to 30 percent every five to 10 years. Um, the the economy is much more diversified than ever before in rural America. Like all of the trends about rural America since the year I was born in 1970 have been upward trending. The rural population's gotten bigger, not everywhere, but even in places where it's gone down, they've remained stable. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it's been my lifelong goal to let rural people know that you're not dead and dying, like and me as an extension person, I'm not just out here to help your small town die in a respectful way, right? Like we're actually here to help you grow. And that's why I'm in the Center for Community Vitality. And really, for me, this reflects the modern rural. And I kind of say this isn't your grandpa's rural anymore. We're much more diverse in all of these areas. So I do applied research in all of those aforementioned topic areas. And one of them that pertains to this is around rural migration. So really, um, you know, we tend to have a narrative around brain drain that, you know, our high school kids, they want to leave. And apparently that's a huge problem. And my point is, well, let your kids go because our data and research shows there are people in their 30s, 40s and 50s coming back. So maybe we should be asking those people, how are you doing? Like, why did you choose here? What kind of job do you have? And really, that's what we've done for the past, like, oh, 15 years of my career has been interviewing, studying, looking at newcomers, asking why they made the move. This is not just in Minnesota. It's all across the country. And and so along those lines, this, this new study was just revealed not too long ago that, that you guys conducted. What was the what was the scope of that study? How was that study? Uh, uh, conducted and 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 what are some of the key findings do you think that that came from that study right so you know we've got kind of a lot of different rurals in minnesota we've got rural prairie we've got rural recreational rural lakes rural rivers rural pines and like all of these rurals so we uh we we initially in our selection area selected 20 counties so minnesota's got 87 counties and we've selected almost a quarter of them and within those we got a list of all the people who moved in in the past five years and we sampled them and we we invited them to take an online survey um so these include counties on the western uh, side of the state we did cluster them too so right in your neck of the woods from becker and clay all the way down to yellow medicine and over over to candy ojai so we include like wilmer and montevideo and then fergus and alec and group and, and, and communities like that we, we also did like Pipestone, uh, St. Louis County, which has, you know, Duluth plus uh, St. Louis County is huge. So it's more than just like the metro of Duluth. It's also the outlying areas. Um, and we wanted to uh, ask these newcomers, we wanted to, number one, replicate a survey that we did about, uh, I think, in 2009. And the feds, the USDA really want, they were like, wow, this is great uh, news that there's people moving in. Let's update that research. We applied for a grant and got a grant to do this, which led to this project. So we did, we sent out surveys uh, and we are just now conducting focus groups um, in, in selected communities. 
but we received back roughly, I think, 1,600 surveys. And within that, we had new workforce movers, i.e. they were age 20 to 60, 65. But we also got a re really great retiree database out of this because, you know, especially in Ottertail County, you've got a lot of folks with recreational properties who are now translating these recreational properties into their full-time home. So, you know, what are the impacts of having the, these migrations happen to our rural communities? So for us, again, this is very good news. We wanted to better understand the dynamics of how did people make the choice to move to the communities that they did. So we asked these new residents questions around like, why did you move? Um, how do you rate the community in a bunch of different ways? Uh, how often are you engaged in your community? And then we've got some demographics about how old they are, how much money do they make, and, and things like that. So well, interestingly enough, um, I think a lot of people, when they think about people moving into our rural communities, think they're all kids that grew up, moved away, and came back. Where what we have found very consistently in our research, and found this in other states that have done this research, is that just between a quarter, we found in this latest study, just a quarter of the new movers into your communities are from there. So, you know, if you're from there, it's easier to, you know, get help when you're in trouble, right? Uh, that social capital piece. But if you don't know anybody, i.e. three quarters of new people moving into your small towns are not from there. Well, how welcoming is your community? How do they feel like a part of the community? How are they first engaged? I mean, I kind of comically say that here in Minnesota, it's winter for like six months out of the year, or you wouldn't know it if somebody moved in across the street until the spring, because it's dark when you get up and dark when you get home, and it's dark, 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 and then when the light finally breaks, you notice all these new people around your neighborhood. This typically happens, but we don't really uh, and really on our side of it, we really look at welcoming communities. Like how are, what is the experience then that these newcomers have? How do they find out uh, where to get an electrician in town? Or what if your pipe bursts at 1 a.m. and you need a plumber? Like what are all the ways that newcomers love the community? And what are all the ways that newcomers find challenges in the communities? So just again, a quarter of them are from there. Um, we also found that some people move just for a job, right? So. We typically, economic, a lot of economic development folks will have kind of what we call a job first approach. We advertise the job and then hope people apply because and move to your community solely because of that job. Well, what we had found is just a third, I think it was 31% of new movers moved solely for a job. When we asked people like, why did you make the move? Again, that kind of work factors that we talked about. Why did you make the move? The number one reason that people made the move was to take advantage of a slower pace of life. We also had in the top 10, like move closer to relatives, find the less congested place to live, uh, find lower price housing, find a safer place to live, live in a smaller community, the lower your cost of living. And then down the list about number 11 was to take on a new job. Like, so for all you HR folks out there that, you know, hear this and be like, wow, this is great news. We have these people I want to move in. Well, showing off your job is not enough. And so this is why we really kind of turned the corner on how we how we fully comprehend this trend, and we call it a resident recruitment model. Because not only are you trying to get a worker, you're trying to find a new resident, somebody who wants to participate in community life, somebody who's you know, gonna join the school board potentially, right? I mean, though that's not the first question you ask right. them, is hey, you wanna sit on the board? You um, the school board? <laughs> yeah, right. right. So we find all these really um, great reasons. So kind of my point here is that when our HR folks, if all they do is show off your job, that's not enough because that job, especially in a tight labor market, which i.e., you know, four months ago, we were in a very tight labor market and we will potentially be returning to this type of tight labor market. And when we return to this, showing off your job is not going to be enough. You need to show off to people what their life is going to be like. And that's really what led to right your position here, Eric, is that this is this position that you all have supported here in Ottertail County is the nation's first resident recruitment initiative coordinator. No other county, no other community across the nation made an investment this early on to work on a resident recruitment model. So anyway, that aside, we did do this new survey. The, uh, the report will be out in the next couple months. So these are kind of preliminary findings. They may change slightly. So I don't want to be cited necessarily on all this. We're just kind of sharing right. where we're at here. Right. Um, so this really, of course, throws a wrench in the, uh, how do you recruit people when it's not not just the job, right? Now it becomes more complex. Now I need to do people work. And I think that's where you come in, right? Yeah, and, and I, I, I've, I was on a radio show the, the other day. They were talking about 
you know, how, how do you do this? And, and it's as much about selling a lifestyle as it is about anything about a job, right? Like this, right. you are, it's a lifestyle choice. You are choosing to live in this area right. for all of the things that you mentioned, the, the, all of the positive things that you mentioned. Right. Um, what, one of the, and I, I won't quote you on any, I mean, this is all recorded, but I won't, you know, say what right. Ben Winchester said, but one of the, one of the info or some of the data is it data or data. I never know. Either one. Yeah. Either, potato. Okay, you're not, yeah. Potato, potato, potato. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll call, I'll call it, I'll call it, I'll call it data. One, okay. one of the points was it, it talked about what are the amenities that you, and this was the, the newcomers, hmm. like what are the amenities that you most frequent and lakes lakes right. was was way up there so i feel good right <laughs> you know i don't want to cherry i don't want to cherry pick data but i feel really good about that slide like i'm gonna right. i'm gonna show Lake, that slide off a yeah lot. lakes 80 overall 82 percent of respondents of newcomers said they're going to lakes or other bodies of water 86 percent parks and they're kind of intertwined in some yeah, ways right, but right, right. right i mean it's very much an outdoor recreation um so you know it is interesting when we talk about it, it is this lifestyle so one thing that folks will say, especially I hear this in southwestern part of the state or in the panhandle of Nebraska, where they're like, well, I don't know, we got nothing but prairie here. Nobody wants this. You're wrong. Like what's, what's cool to one person isn't cool to me necessarily. But, but you know, like, I mean, you got a lot of pheasant hunters that love living on a prairie, right? So I, I think there's before you start downplaying yourself, because I hear this all the time when communities are like, oh, we don't have any of these cool things. I just want to remind you that there is something for everyone and there is everyone for something <laughs> in this nation. So we've got a lot of different rules that, that can be appealed to. Right. And, and, and the one thing I keep telling communities is you may not know it, but people want to live in your community for what you are right now. Right. Not not necessarily what you used to be and not necessarily what you could be someday if everything worked out. What you are right now is attractive to right. somebody out there. It's just a matter of connecting with them and 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 then guiding them, you know, showing them the way. So, well, and that's just it. My key point then is about the narrative. What kind of narrative do you have in your town? If your narrative is built on things that happened 50, 60 years ago, like, oh, I remember the days when we used to have two grocery stores and now we have one, or now we used to have five gas stations and now we have one, or now we don't even have a school anymore. I mean, you hear these negative narratives consistently and they have impacted our small towns. But I just, you know, I remind people that nobody ever moves to your town for pity. Like, oh, you know what, Eric, I feel really bad that, you know, Slate, Minnesota, which isn't in your region, but Slate and really, you know, I felt bad they lost their grocery store 26 years ago. So I'm just going to move there to help out today. Like, right, people are actually seeing hope and opportunity every day in our small town. So my goal is to lift up the voices of these newcomers, because many times the, re the existing long term resident population they fall into the negative narrative. They, you know, aside from, you know, chamber directors and whatnot who are, right, you know, tend to right, be cheerleaders, right. but they can right. be cheerleaders for good reason because people actually want to live there. And kind of what I say today is if all our small towns are dying, then why can't I find a house to buy? Like it's virtually impossible to find homes to buy in rural America today. So there we go. There you go. Well, I, I tell you what, I, I, I always enjoy talking to you. I, your enthusiasm is contagious and it's, it's, Thanks. it's, you're, you're like my guru. And I, when I hear you, this thing, I'm reminded of the things that I need to be mindful of as, as I try to do my job. So we, we look forward to, to seeing more, more of the, the, the data or data come out. And, uh, and, and as always, thanks for your, your words of wisdom and uh, words right. of wisdom. And thanks for doing what you do. Yeah, if anybody wants to read more, uh, they can visit our website, which is at uh, z for Zulu dot umn dot edu slash brain gain g a i n. We are actually gaining brains in our rural communities. Thanks for having me, Eric. You bet.